What's up, YouTube? Hello, my subs. I love you. Welcome back for another dyslexic author reading of Fairies of Elysium by myself, Danielle Marie Linton. Today we will be working on chapter two. This one is a little bit lengthy, so make sure you get yourself comfortable, get yourself your coffee, your wine, your whiskey, whatever, your crochet, sit down and relax. It is now time for chapter two. My husband is the love of my life. I know in my heart that our love will go on forever, throughout all of eternity. I met Brian, then called Lane, when I was only 15 years old. I was a young woman in those days, and he was a young man of 19 years. I saw him in the marketplace, among the dust of the market and the stink of the people. I didn't see anything but him. With every step that he took through the market, my eyes followed until he must have finally felt my gaze and looked up at me. His light, sky-blue eyes captivated me. Lane kept staring at me until he finally approached. His beautiful golden hair caught every ray from the sun, making him look like an angel with a halo. When he kissed my hand, at that very moment, he kissed my soul. I've been in love with him ever since. The days that I got to spend with Lane were like heaven on earth to me. It did not matter what we did or where we went. As long as I could spend time with him, I was truly happy. We had mutual respect for one another. Thinking back to when I was so young, it is amazing to me that I could feel so strongly towards someone. Lane was my friend and my soulmate. When you are in a relationship that creates such wonderful feelings, it is hard to ever imagine a time when you could go without that special person. I never imagined then that the love that I had at 15 years old would forever shape the rest of my life the way that Lane was a gentleman. He was firm in his faith for God. I too tried to live my life as a warrior against sin. I prayed daily and I believed that the times Lane and I prayed together made our relationship stronger. It was wonderful to think that God was looking down on us and perhaps smiling because of the match he had made. Our relationship was innocent and was formed from love, not lust. Today, men and women explore their bodies in such a way that many back then never even discussed. Lane never touched me beyond a kiss or an embrace. My parents and I lived simply as farmers. My father grew barley, oats, and some wheat. We lived in a simple dwelling that was a single-story cottage. We lived on an individual small holding in a farming community. Our house was a crook frame, which is hard to explain unless you are an architect. The crook was used as a supporting framework, and the walls were lined with peat moss for insulation. Heather, a flower of sorts, made uh, the most durable roof, but broom, fern, straw, and weeds were also used. Our fire was in the center of our cottage with a chimney overhead. We lived on the west side of Scotland, where there were woods, mountains, and lakes. To the east of Scotland, there was the sea. I never saw the sea. The west was my home. 
and I never had thoughts of leaving. No place could have been my home without the love and support of my family. In truth, I could have lived anywhere as long as my mother, father, and husband were there. One day in the fall, when the leaves were blowing on the wind and the barley fields waved, Lane began to run through the field. He beckoned me to chase after him, which I did, despite the layers of clothes that I carried on my body. My muslin dress was thin and soft, but my outer layers of Celtic plaid were woolen and stiff. Lane broke a small sweat, which lay in small round droplets on his forehead. He stopped running that I might catch up with them. He stood in the center of the field and smiled as I neared. He glowed as he watched me. Lane was not the most handsome looking young man in the village, but his features called to me. His skin was light, his hair was blonde, and his eyes were a brilliant blue. His eyes would keep me captive when I looked into them. I imagine that even if I were not attracted to his face, as long as he had those brilliant blue eyes, I would have still been in love with him. My breathing was deep and drawn out as I tried to catch my breath. Lane's was finally beginning to slow. I came close to Lane and both of us just smiled at each other. As if we both were thinking as one, we kissed. He embraced my face and kissed me with such meaning. I had never been kissed before. Lane's sweat beads began to roll slowly down the sides of his face. He pulled away to look at my face. I will never forget in this lifetime or any other how he looked at me after that first kiss. I love you, Jazeel. One day I want us married. As to accept these loving words, I kissed Lane again. We fell into the barley and kissed. The ground was cool. The barley was beautiful overhead as it waved with the instruction of the wind. We lay there and looked at each other's faces. I had never before felt so alive in my heart. I felt that my life at that point was perfect and I wanted to freeze frame so that this moment could live on forever. There have been only a handful of moments in my hundreds of years that I have ever wanted to freeze in time. Have you ever caught yourself in a moment where you felt perfectly happy? The world around you melts away and for a minute or less your life is perfect. The wind began to grow colder so we headed back walking hand in hand. If your father sees me he will have my head on a platter. I laughed at the thought. Lane smiled back and then became serious. Will you tell him then? Will you tell your father that you love me? I thought for a moment. Then I realized that I had not told Lane that I loved him too. How did he know? I was bold to ask. How do you know that I share love for you? I never spoke the words. Lane smiled and stopped walking so that he might touch my face again. Some things speak louder than words. A glance, a touch. Your eyes share your thoughts with me. Should I not have told you that I love you? Do I make you feel discomfort by saying so? Oh, I could feel nothing but love for you and comfort with you. My heart beats for you, but you know that already. Lane picked me up in an embrace. He was tall and strong. I was a doll in his arms, fragile and meek. Marry me, Jazeel. I was overblown by his spontaneity. The feeling had come into his heart that he wanted to marry me and his mouth spoke without hesitation. I only could nod yes. My heart leapt. Lane and I had only known each other personally for four months. We had only lived out our feelings for each other for the past two weeks. I anticipated that my father would want us to have a longer engagement before entering a union so quickly. Whether I married him after two weeks or after years, I knew in my heart that my feelings would still be the same. 
Love does not come about after ages of time. It is in full form from the moment you meet your soulmate, and it will remain full through all of time. Lane was a simple farmer like the rest of the people in the community. He worked hard in the heat of the summer and even harder in the winter. His sheep provided wool and his fields grew by. His arms were strong and I could see his muscles as he pitched straw into high piles with his pitchfork. I would hide behind the other piles of straw in hopes that Lane did not know I was watching him. I loved to see him in his natural state. After some time, he would always find me hiding behind a pile and he would take the opportunity to kiss my cheeks. Lane was always so patient with everyone he knew and with his animals too. I never knew him to say an unkind word to anyone, even to those who may have been unkind to him. Lane had no family. Both of his parents had died when he was 12 years old. Although I never asked for the details, I heard from others that they had some illness. Lane was fortunate not to catch the deadly illness. He had no brothers or sisters, just like me. He was eager to make me his wife so that he could start a family. I would become the only family he knew. What I wanted most was to make Lane happy. I wanted the sparkle in his eyes to never go out. I never wanted to see him cry. I wanted to be submissive and cleave to him, making him happy to call me his wife. To be married would be a privilege. It was meant for man and woman to be together, yet some women and men in our community were not blessed enough to fall in love. The most amazing part of a relationship is seeing how the other person can love. I knew that I was blessed with a pretty face, but what of the rest of me? Lane loved me for who I was inside. He loved my spontaneity, my humor, my talents, and the way that I could give love. Each moment that we spent felt like we had known one another for years. We both agreed that our souls surely must have been together in heaven. My beauty slowly became a curse. The king, young King John Douglas, would ride through the village just to catch glances of me at my daily chores. King John was from the Royal Douglas clan of Scotland. He had looks that were in good taste. His hair was dark brown, and his eyes were equally as dark. His face was handsome, and he was tall and slender. He wasn't married, so he took great pleasure in taking mistresses to serve the manly parts of him. King John did not take counsel well. He, of course, was advised to take a queen. He would reject all suitable ladies of court after he promised to make them queen, and then slept with them. When a woman's place in the bed started to bore him, she would simply be dismissed. As a result, many young women remained tormented the rest of their lives because of their acquired black sheep status in their community. No one wanted to marry damaged goods. No man or woman could have respect for any young lady who was so readily used. I only st understood these things later once my innocence was lost. At that time, in the grand scheme of life, I only knew love and respect for my parents, Lane, home, and my land. Such issues of intimacy were rarely discussed, thus leaving my mind innocent and pure. Lane and I became engaged to be married. The only setback was the dowry that my father wanted to save for me. He wanted to have enough to give Lane so that our lives could start together in a good financial state. The worst thing for simple village folk was not being able to pay taxes due to the king. Lane and I decided to wait for only a few months for my father's situation to change. Perhaps by then my dowry would be plentiful. The three months that we waited for matrimony were the three months that destroyed my life. 
Other lives around me were also taken. My hair flowed like the River Nile. It was long, down to my knees, with natural waves, and had a pretty almond and auburn luminescence. My eyes were a piercing green, which was somewhat common among most of the Scots in my village. My parents, from the time I was a small girl of ten years old, would allow me to walk a few steps in front of them through the marketplace, just to observe the looks and hear the comments from others about my beautiful hair. As a teen of fourteen years, I began to fill out until I had a bosom that was plump, but just hardy enough to enhance my tiny features. My waist has always been small, and my height only five feet. My mother said that if ever a fairy existed, I was it. It was a joke between us, and never thought of as a foreshadowing of my future. Wayne and I would meet every day behind a straw pile belonging to my neighbor, my neighbor's farm. The neighbor's farm was far enough away to be out of sight, yet close enough for us to hear when I was being called. He kissed me on my lips, cheeks, and neck with such softness. We both learned together how to do such things, and he was never rough with me the way I had often observed the king with his mistresses. Lane told me that some men were rough like that, but he felt that a gentle woman should always be treated gently. Although Lane was older than I, his body was still pure like mine. We never put our bodies closer than a kiss or an embrace. We looked forward to the day when our bodies could explore our love for each other, although I was not completely sure what that all entailed. Both of us looked forward to having children and living together. Lane was the model for all men. He was hard working in the field until he was sweaty and dirty, but always gentle and sweet when I was in his presence. Lane assured me that I was always beautiful to him and that he loved me. He told me so every day. I had prayed for a love like that, and God was good to me. In all of my years, I never found another man that came close to comparing to Lane. None could or would ever. Unfortunately, we humans have a way of messing up God's divine plan with our crappy sense of free will. King John began to come around the market every day. His presence always unnerved me, causing the tiny hairs on my arm to stand on end. I knew deep inside that this man would be the one to take my destiny away from me. Gossip soon began to circulate that the king was looking at me as his new mistress. He stared at me as I walked and was always able to draw the attention of others while he gazed. Soon my mother and father observed his behavior and became afraid of his lustful glances. Everyone took notice, in fact. The king knew that soon I would be married, and on that night he could feel free to take me into his bed. This was the crude custom of those times. My father spoke privately to Lane, and together they devised a plan for us to sneak away quickly after a quiet wedding ceremony. Lane would take me to another part of Scotland, where we would build a house in the woods and raise a family. Perhaps we would even build our home beside the sea. We could have discovered the many sea animals of which we had only heard, but had never seen. My parents promised they would never say they knew our whereabouts. They would keep my whereabouts secret from the eyes and ears of the villagers and possible informers. Later, my parents would sneak away to join us and help to raise their grandchildren. My mother worked quickly on a new dress for me. Weddings for simple folks were not flashy or anything spectacular, and any dress would have served quite nicely. Being an only child did have its advantages. My mother always wanted me to have the best, and so a new dress was made. It was a lovely dark brown dress with long flowing sleeves 
and the bodice cut so that my bosom showed its creases. For the first time in my life, I saw what everyone else saw. I was a beautiful maiden. My long flowing hair was part of my adornment that was not made by my mother. I also had a simple flower wreath to my place, to place on my head. My father's eyes started to mist over as he looked at me. He loved me so much. I was still a child in his eyes, although I was considered to be a woman in those days. I was only 15 years old and had just begun my menstruation only two years before. Time was different then, but the situations never change. I was a woman at 15. I was married to my love. The ceremony was simple. No rings, no guests, no cake, and only the vows in which we promised to be as one in the sight of God. Our ceremony was in my parents' cottage, and when it was over, our friar left quickly and quietly, trying not to be noticed. Soon after him, Lane walked out, only to be seen in a passing glance by King John Douglas. King John quickly noted the friar that proceeded before Lane. He rode up and stopped the, fri the friar, questioning him about where he had been. Friar said that the young lady Jaziel was sick, and he came to pray for her and give her the sacrament of being anointed with oil. The longer the questioning went on, the more Friar began to sweat. King John knew that he was telling a falsehood. King John's men took the Friar, a man of God, into their hands. He must understand the seriousness of this action. Today, when an officer takes you to jail, in most cases, you spend the night, pay a fine, and then you are released. In my time, punishment was cruel and often without just cause. King John was known for his cruelty and feared by everyone. Once our friar was taken, we knew that no one was safe. My father came out of the house and immediately noticed the disconcerting silence. King John was standing at the foot of the door. My father thought how odd it was for King John not to send one of his men. The situation unnerved my father. He knew that we were caught. By this time, I had already changed out of my wedding adornments and into my everyday dress. My possessions were gathered, and I was ready to go. I had to meet Lane. Just then, my father was pushed out of the way, and King John barged in. I stood there with my mother at my side. As soon as I saw his face, I began to shake. My mother and my father were ordered to be taken by the guards. I thought at that point that I would do my parents. I remember the conversation. I will tell it in a language you can understand. You are looking well, Jazeel. Your friar tells a tale of you being sick. I see no sickness on this face or fever on this brow. He began to feel my face and brow very gently. His eyes had an odd mixture of love, lust, and jealousy. Perhaps, was, perhaps this was the moment for which he had been waiting. He needed to catch me vulnerable in order to get me to come with him. He continued to speak in a cocky voice, proud to be in control. I know what you just did. You know that you are mine before you are his. Come with me and live, or the friar and your family will die. I tried to act and sound like I didn't know what he was talking about. I know not what you speak. You lie. Do you know what happens when your king is lied to? Yes. I lie not. I am sick. I, I am sick every day. I cannot lie down beside you. I am with child, I said, stammering to think of an excuse that might turn his eye away from me and onto someone else. 
Ah, then you are married still. Unless you lay down with him before your wedding, which I do not believe. You, a maiden of such quality. You belong to me first. I couldn't do anything but stand still. I was thinking about Lane. I hoped with all hopes that he was in our meeting spot. I stood there like a board. King John took his hand over my heart to feel my fierce thumping. Then his hand caressed my breast. Never had I been touched in such a way. I felt violated. My husband is the only one that should be touching me like this, I thought. He felt both of my breasts slowly, and then his hands moved down to my stomach. The king felt my stomach and then moved his hand lower until he almost touched my private area. I knew what he was doing, and I was afraid. He was checking to see if my breasts and stomach were swollen. I would be caught in a lie, and then my family would be doomed. I don't believe you to be with child. I believe you to be young and vulnerable. It is the filth that you live in that makes you ill. If you are sick, it will pass. I believe that you know not how babes are made. I do not believe you to be spent at all. Married, I do believe you to be. But your maidenhead, I believe, is with you. Do you know what your maidenhead is? He walked around me as he spoke. His hands were folded behind him, and he breathed down my neck. I stood still. My eyes began to water. I was confused with his playful words. My head was trying to pick out the meaning to each sentence. I realized I could not make love to my husband on our wedding night. He continued to speak in a monotone voice. He had no regard for my feelings. I was so scared that I nearly urinated on myself. Am I correct about that? There is only one man who can show you how it is done. I will let them go if you come with me. You will have new clothes, good food, and the only work that you will have to do is please me. Tears came silently down my cheek. My head was spinning. I just wanted my family and Lane in safety. My king? Yes, you may question. Will you please spare also the life of my husband? I will lay with you forever if you only spare the lives of those I love. <laughs> King John put on a sheepish grin and then spoke with satire and sarcasm. Forever. <laughs> How many children will be fathered in that time, I wonder? This marriage can be forgotten. Perhaps even a queen can be taken. Many things in forever. Many things can happen in forever. Are you still true to your word? Yes, my king. I will let the friar and your parents go. Your husband will go free under one condition. You never speak his name again. From this day forward, you belong to me. I cannot have the name of another man spoken in my presence, for it ruins my mood. A certain entity may become soft and not be able to harden for the occasion, you understand. I think I am going to be ill. This man is a fiend, and I am his prey, I thought, for a moment. I would think of Lane night and day, and in my mind I would forever speak his name. No king could ever take the love that I felt away from me. I agreed. I never said farewell to my parents or to my surroundings. I was taken unceremoniously and lifted onto the king's horse. As I rode off with him, 
He held on to me from behind. I could feel him pushing his manhood up against me. I was scared. I tried to cry silently, but my tears began to choke me. King John became tender. He spoke not harshly, but as a man determined to purchase my love. Do not cry. I will care for you and provide for you. Perhaps someday you will learn to love me. Love. Some of us search for an eternity to have real love. What King John had for me was merely an obsession. He wanted control of me, control of my feelings and my body, nothing more. Maria was the head maid of the castle. She became the woman that I would go to when I needed advice or if I needed a comforting embrace. She was older, like a grandmother, with a big bosom and a healthy body. Her face was tainted brown from the sun and wrinkled. At one time, she was a nursemaid for the king himself. Although he drank the milk from her breast, she was never regarded as a mother or figure to him, at least not in the presence of others. I felt that if I could trust any person at all, it would be gentle Maria. I sat in my own chambers. I had space of my own in the castle, but no appreciation of it. No amount of lavish luxury could ever take the place of a humble surroundings with the ones that I loved. My true family was my mother, father, and Lane. How could I have a life without any of them? John left me to myself for a little while. I had to get used to my new quarters and to my situation. I had spent the days in my bed, which was large and soft compared to my hay-filled sleeping corner. I wanted to sleep off the pain of my loss. I never expected that losing love could hurt so badly. My heart, I could feel, was breaking. My soul was going into shock from the absence of its mate. Day in and day out, from that point in time, I knew that I would think about Lane every moment. Not a day could ever go by where I didn't think of him. In private, I called him John. At his request, I lived in the castle for three nights before John wanted me in his bed. The day I knew I was to lose my virginity finally came. Several maids came bursting into my guest chamber as I put on my gown to sleep. After they bathed me, they held out a new garment for me to wear. I needed to don a virgin white nightgown. After I had dressed into it, the maids began to fix my hair and one lined the back of my neck with some kind of scented oil. I was to be presented as a young virgin rose. Maria came to me and said that I was requested in the king's chambers. She held my hand and said not to be afraid. The other maids looked at each other with a look that strangely said for what I was in store for. I walked slowly down the corridor and began to shake. I was scared to death of what was coming. I was terrified of bearing my naked body in front of another, especially one that I did not love. I felt faint from thinking about how God must be looking down on me. I tried to be good. What will I be after this? Will I be looked at like Mary Magdalene before Jesus took her sins away? Will members of the royal court spit on me as I pass? Maria told me to relax my body when the pain came and to think of something else. She said that if I let him touch me and tried to like it, the pain would come with more ease. She urged me to speak to him gently and not to show him I was frightened. She advised me not to show my innocence. I was so desperately confused. Pain where? I was frightened as Maria 
walked me down to the king's chamber door. I felt as if I were a small mouse about to walk into the chambers of a huge hungry cat. My body began to shake more fiercely and the palms of my hands began to sweat. Even my lips and teeth began to chatter as they did in the winter air. I took a deep breath. I rapped on John's door and I was told to enter. When I entered, he was sitting on the bed in a robe. I looked around the room and saw a lit fire, a candelabra, a large royal bed with heavy coverlets, and a rug on the floor. I saw a huge tapestry hanging on the wall of stone. The ceilings look high to me, and the room large and hollow. If I had felt like a mouse outside of the door, now I surely felt like a bedbug. He told me to close the door. As the door clanged shut behind me, I felt that I was sealing my fate. I just stood there, as close to the door as possible. I knew so little about how to please a man. I, I wanted to appease him, to keep my family alive. What if I am terrible? Would he then punish me by killing Lane? If Lane and I were doing this together, he would not know if I were terrible since neither of us have done this before. God, please, please forgive me. I decided to speak. If I let John into my life a little, perhaps forever with him would be easier to bear. John, I'm afraid. My body shakes. I know not how to please a man. I want to please you. I'm ashamed that I do not know how. You have done this before. I have not. I will never forget the look on his face when I opened up my heart to him. His face dropped. He took on his tender face and then rose from the bed. I had already pleased him by my actions thus far. He came to me and held me close and whispered into my ear. His voice was not jeering, but gentle as it began my seduction. Be not afraid of me. I will be soft. Then John began to kiss my neck. I felt so scared that my body could not even fathom what he was doing. He continued to hold me and then touch my breasts as he, as he did in my home. This time was different though. He was being soft with me. He seemed to be trying to please me too. John lifted my small body and took me to his bed. I thought of Lane. I wondered what making love to him would have been like. I wondered if he was safe. I wondered if he would hate me for the woman that I would soon become. I thought about all these things while the king touched me. He touched all of me. I didn't know what to do, so I did nothing. I lay beneath him as he started to kiss my body and undress me. I was embarrassed. Nobody had ever seen my naked body before. I would not be like some of the lovely women who he had been with before. My young body was skinny. My hair flowed freely. And I tried to pull it over my breast to cover my private parts. I tried to cover myself with my arms, too. John saw my embarrassment and pulled a soft coverlet over me. He soon joined me under the coverlet after he unrobed himself. He seemed to have no shame in being naked. I closed my eyes, too afraid and embarrassed to look at his nakedness. John began to kiss my naked skin and then looked up at me. Does this please you? John cares how I feel? I did not understand him. Maybe he did feel love back. If I pretended to reciprocate the same feelings, I could keep my family and Lane safe. 
With shaking hands, I reached out to him and welcomed him into my, onto my body. I felt that if I were to keep my family safe, I needed to play the part of a dutiful mistress. I will play the part. For the first time, he kissed my lips. He continued this way until he could no longer go on without fulfilling the tender part of him. Slowly and tenderly, he entered between my legs. The pain was terrible. A man was on my small body, seeking pleasure. I tried to relax my body, as Maria had said. After some minutes passed, that terrible pain dissipated, but lingered on, although it was no longer sharp. I immediately felt like the best part of me was taken away. I was married, but not to this man. I was becoming a woman, but I felt like a guilty child. My feelings were jumbled and my mind was wondering when he felt his pleasure. It was over. Physically, it was not as horrible as I had anticipated, but not as good as it could have been with Lane. Mentally and emotionally, however, was a different story. After panting several minutes like a dog, he rolled his sweaty body off of mine. You please me, Jazeel. I know that you will not feel the pleasure until later. I felt pleasure, I lied. I couldn't believe my own ears. In truth, I thought that this act was horrible. I would have rather been picking up the royal horse's shite. My beautiful body, I knew, was broken now. Imagine that pleasure increased by a hundredfold. That is the pleasure you, are, you will feel someday. He rose naked and walked over to a table where he drank some wine. I sat up in the bed with the coverlet pulled around my shoulders. I looked at the bed where I was taken and saw blood. I was ashamed and I began to cry. John brought wine to me and made me drink. After a cup of wine, I no longer felt ashamed or embarrassed. My head felt as if it was starting to float. My body felt warm and tired. Stay in my bed tonight, every night hereafter, John said to me as he offered me more wine to drink. I shivered. John picked up my night clothes from the floor and helped me into them. The candles in his room were getting low, and I wondered how much time had passed. My head was fuzzy, and I felt weak. The light seemed to get dimmer. I fainted on John, and that was all I could remember.